A foremost exponent of the sitar, Mungal Padasar plays and teaches several instruments, including the tabla, the harmonium, the mandolin, sitar, as well as vocals. He has written and lectured on Indian classical music and Indo-Calypso jazz and has performed internationally. He is founder and director of the Caribbean School of Indian Music and the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Hummingbird Gold Medal Award for his contribution in the field of culture. Today on Carib Nation Television, we feature Mungal Padasar and the Pantar Group. With me is Mangal Padasar and Pantar, and he has just uh, given us a wonderful taste of what his band can do here at the Kennedy Center. Thank you so much for joining us on Carib Nation, and welcome to Washington. Thank you very much. It's my it pleasure. was a pleasure hearing you, and I, most people don't know about the sitar. Yes. Uh, they haven't heard a lot about it, and of course, they don't associate it with Trinidad and Tobago, of coming from the Caribbean. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the sitar and how you came to be using it and, and how you developed it to the yes. level that you have. Well, the sitar is, a, is an instrument that, that found its final stages of its evolution in the 12th century in India. It originated from a, an, another instrument called the Tritan Travina, which, um, well, I mean, it, it, legend, legend has it that it, it began with the beginning of time. Um, the sitar, though, it is, it, it is an adaptation of that in which they created an instrument which is lighter to take around. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, it has become one of perhaps the most versatile instruments in India. Unfortunately or fortunately, it's what you call a one key instrument designed to play classical music only. My involvement with sitar is that I, I was actually inspired by Pandit Ravi Shankar, who is well known the world over when I heard his first CD. And I was already a musician, and um, I just wanted to get to learn the sitar only for my own purpose. Mm -hmm. um, that is, my own inner peace and happiness and all that. I learned, I, I learned and practiced for 10 years until I think now, in retrospect, I can see that. It was a natural evolution that people started to insist that I do public performances. And then I began doing public performances and left the other instruments that I had to play. And since I started my public performances, I never had time to get back to the other <laughs> instrument because it was so much in demand. Uh -huh. um, at least sitar started as my hobby. And it is only, I started professional sitar when I was 40 years old. Wow. Yeah. And you, your first instrument was the mandolin. Was the mandolin, the accordion, the tabla, keyboard. Um, those are the instruments that I played. I even had a stint with the guitar. But when I got into sitar, the world ceased that to just, exist. Just, yes. just grabbed you. Yes.
gradually from mandolin to, to sitar, yes, I yes. take That it. 10 years that I was practicing sitar in chambers, um, I was also actively performing with the mandolin. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so the sitar is really a second instrument that I was learning and I, I, I took a, a, a perfectionist approach to the instrument. I wanted to be perfect in everything. And that 10 years culminated in my going to India and studying under the master for five years. Yes, I, I was just going to say that uh, that gift or that interest, obviously, yes. there must have been some hidden talent or some gift waiting there Quite, well, just to be developed because yes. you excelled um, yes. in the sitar yes, yes. and won a number of awards, got a scholarship, as yes, you said, to go yes. to India yeah, to yeah. study. Uh, mm -hmm. What did that do for you personally? Well, the thing is about my, the music that I play and my involvement in music was always for my own personal development. Mm -hmm. It was more like a spiritual exercise for me. And it is, the thing is that when I take up the sitar, I, I am automatically transported into another world. Wow. And um, I still practice classical very strongly, but because I have to liaise with a public that cannot really take the classical fully, I developed a, another method which was diffusion music and as a result of which I give to the public small doses of sitar within the context of other instruments mm -hmm. so that if you observe in one of the pieces, the pan was playing a piece and then the sitar would repeat that piece. It was just, that is to demonstrate to the public, this is how the pan plays it and this is how the sitar plays it. it. You did a great job of uh, almost talking yes. to the other instruments yes. through the sitar. Yes. Yes. Talk a little bit about what that takes and, and that fusion, as you talked about, between the steel pan and the sitar. Yes. And I understand you also have a, a jazz. Yes, a uh, jazz ensemble that, that, accompanies, uh, that accompanies my music. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the, the idea of the language between the instrument is that it is an inherent part of Indian classical studies that every instrument has its own language. And um, for instance, I can speak to the tabla player. He plays. He will play dagetita, dagetita, kada, kada, and I will play da 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 da. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the language. Right. So when that is transported into into notes and tones, it becomes uh, the language that we speak about. Mm -hmm. um, my panist, Harold Hadley, who is also a, 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 a university person, in other words, he has studied music to the, to the highest level, and um, he has sort of fall in tune with what I am doing, and he understands the ragas. Uh -huh. The guitarist is studying ragas. They are all they have all studied ragas under yeah. my tutelage. I see. As a result of which. You find that even my saxophonist, who's a rasta, he is studying the ragas in order to be able to communicate. And um, I'm studying jazz. So it is a fair exchange between us, both of us. And because I didn't think that um, they should study what I'm doing and I, should, and I should not study what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So as a result of which, that fertilization is taking place 
because we are all taking an interest in studying each other's mm -hmm. music. And that expands the music even Precisely. Later. A new genre has been created. Completely, yes. Yeah. yes. What you mentioned about uh, your tutelage, do you go out and try to extend this and, and hopefully extend its life through teaching younger people? Well, I, I've taught, I taught music for over 33 years to young people for free of charge. At any one given time, I had a number of like 200 students wow. and on my list. And I had a full-time job, so I devoted every weekend my to goodness. teaching for so many years, so over 30 years. And um, it was only in recent time that the music has become quite popular. And I've been leaving Trinidad and spending at least eight months out of Trinidad mm. that I had to cease teaching. But I still have a few of my very devoted students who whenever I'm available in Trinidad, they come and get their lessons and they will continue practicing while I'm away. I see. Yeah. Where have you been able to travel to with the, with the tent? Well, with Europe the was my base. I did a lot of work in France, as you know, Virgin sponsored the last CD that I did. And Virgin was responsible for hooking me up with a number of promoters and all that. So we've done France, I mean like 12, 15 times a year. Wow. I've done Germany, Berlin. Um, I've done the Caribbean. I've done, uh, at least I did one short Lincoln Center here. I haven't really touched the Americas too much because um, I, 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 my concentration was in Europe. Yeah. But I recently, within the last two months, I did a show at the Hummingbird Center with David Rudder oh, and yeah. Andy Narell. And that show made a, such a great impact that it is now being asked for in Europe and in the Caribbean. Wow. Yeah. So you really expanded it uh, yes, and yes, taking yes. it to, to the yes. widest corners of the, the earth. The so globe, to speak. of course. Yes. And um, David Rudder has a song called The Ganges and the Nile. And that song, I did, I did my own interpretation of that song, and David sings that song with my interpretation. Wow. Yeah. That and is then, truly crossing over. Yeah, that's the true crossing over. Yes. And I, I have a song that I wrote called Dreadlock, and David sings that Dreadlock in my format. Oh, wow. Yeah. response do you get from people around the world to this strange instrument? Well, I, I must say that I am extremely happy and fulfilled by what I've received so far. We have never had a performance where the response was not positive. Mm -hmm. And I'm so, I thank God for that more than anything else. Because I'm always a little bit insecure when I face an audience because I never can tell what that audience reaction will be. Mm -hmm. But so far, I am now beginning to build a bit of confidence in that we have never had a failure. Thank yes. God. Yes. <laughs> I see your son is also playing yes. with you. Yes. Um, did you decide that this was something you were going to train your son with early, or did he just uh, express an interest? It was a natural evolution. My three children, they all just took to music, just like duct takes to water. Yes, it's in the genes. Yes, yes because when he was three years old, he was already creating rhythms wherever he was. 
and in fact at the age of four he used to have to sit on my lap to reach the tabla to play and he had his first concert at the age of five wow. where he performed for 20 minutes in one piece really at and five? and he had an audience oh of over 2,000 people just on the edge of the seat wow. let me ask you in terms of this issue of music piracy that is striking the Caribbean, the wave that seems to be uh, going across the Caribbean. With something as unique as you have here, I'm sure, as you said, you produced two CDs yes. and uh, you're working on your third CD yes. right now. Yes. Uh, we have been hearing very often that music piracy is something that the Caribbean has not taken seriously, or the Caribbean governments have not taken seriously enough to protect the artists. Yes. What is your view on that and how do you propose to make your contribution? The thing is that music piracy is something that it is almost out of the hands of the artist. The, the most that the artist can do is agitate to get government to recognize the severity of the problem. And we have formed ourselves into a group of artists who have been lobbying government to take some steps. And the Trinidad and Tobago government has taken some steps and has instituted some new laws with stiffer fines for people um, who are in the piracy. And in fact, the police have been making raids on these pi pirates. Now, has uh, legislation also made it possible for you to sue uh, pirates? No. Um, although it is possible, the law can be, you know, mm -hmm. the law is very flexible. But right now, what is happening is that the police are the ones who I have, see. and the copyright organization. In the hands of law well, in a way, I mean, vicariously, the copyright organization represents artists. Mm -hmm. And when they take action, it is the artists really taking the action. Okay. do you have for the future? Well, the thing is that my son Prashant is now planning on going to London to settle for about two years where he wants to complete his studies in accounts. Mm. And that exposure, I also think, that will suit him fine because there's a beautiful audience and 
community in England mm -hmm. that um, will support his music. So, an obvious part of our life has been, no matter what we study, um, the music was always a part of our life, just like we eat and right. we drink and we rest. So the music has always been part of that. So you will find time, he will find, he will find a place time for to, it. To do that, yes. uh, He will be performing solo, I take it, or will he? Uh, no, I think he will link up with some group or the other. I see. Um, I have some performances carded for London, so he will mix with me there. Then I have some stuff in Germany, and it will be easy for him to join me there. So um, I think I haven't lost him in the sense that for major performances, mm -hmm. um, you still have he will be involved. Mm -hmm. In fact, last night Dane Gulfson was asking him to do something on his CD, and I told Gideon, well, he will be in London. And Dane said, Mongol, I need him so badly that I am going to ask him to come from London to the States. Um, and do the stuff. Really? So it's opening up, you know. Yes. Yeah. How, tell me, for the benefit of, of people who want to learn the instrument, what would you relate it to? Is it like learning to play a piano, a guitar? What, what is involved with learning it? Is it simply flexibility with fingers? What is it? The sitar is unique in the sense that many people ask me, if you can play a guitar, you can play the sitar because those are the closest mm -hmm. instrument to it. Seems so. And I always tell them, no. The sitar has a unique... You play sitar with two fingers, not four fingers. Uh -huh. And um, the, the, the physical movement on a sitar is totally different from that of a guitar. A guitar you play down, the, the four strings or five strings, mm -hmm. or six, as the case may be. Whereas in a sitar, it's a linear movement. I so see. from one note to the other, and that's what make it, makes it so difficult because if you have to play a note here and a note there, you, within the, this, the, the split moment that you could play da 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 with three fingers mm -hmm. on a guitar, you've got to play da da oh, da, you, you know, so, it's, so the, the, the so distances are so far away that you have to be so timed that um, when you have to move from one distance to the other, it has to be done on time. The other thing about the sitar is that you don't only play on the frets like a guitar. You have to make the notes by make, creating tension on the string. So you can get up to five notes on one fret. So, and that's another difficulty. That, um, and and uh, not only a difficulty, a big difference between other conventional instruments. Another thing about the sitar is that whereas the guitar is tuned on the temporary scale, a sitar doesn't necessarily have the same temporal scale as a guitar, piano, or anything like that. It depends on the raga you are playing, you adjust your fret. The frets are all movable. Ah, so you adjust the fret to suit the microtonal differences I in see. the notes. So there's some versatility there as well. Great, yes. And I suppose that is part of the reason why you sit. Yes. You sit, well, traditionally, when I, when I think, I tell my students, I said that sitar was designed to rest on the inner sole of your feet. Really? Uh, yeah, because it, and it anchors the instrument. I when see. you sit with the instrument, this hand has to be free. It has to be totally independent yes, from the sitar. Yes, to be able to make those So movements. it has to be anchored there. Mm -hmm. uh, my friends in the band, always, uh, they were asking me, well, Mangal, you can, you can put a strap on the sitar and go on stage like a guitar. Right. It is possible, mm -hmm. but it is going to be a tremendous task. Is it a heavy instrument? No, it's not very heavy. It's about the same weight as a guitar. And what is it made of? It is made out of wood. Um, the neck is made out of teak or sesame or mahogany. Mm -hmm. But the bottom part is made out of a gourd, something like a calabash. Ah, I see. Okay. And so, so that is very lighter. light. Yeah. Although it looks bulky, but mm -hmm. it's very light. I see. Yeah. Um, in terms of jazz i'd like to go back yeah, a sure. little bit more jazz is, is a fairly free yes uh, genre of music how do you bring the sitar the the the, the nuances <coughs> of the sitar so to speak into that freedom yes that you have in jazz how do you well you see that freedom that you talk about in jazz <coughs> it is a freedom but that freedom can only begin after you learn the rules of the mm. of jazz. True. Like classical Indian music, 
It is a very free improvisational thing. But there are rules that must be mastered. Whenever I, I speak to my students, I, I link it to a traffic light. You are at a, a four corner junction. If you are free to go and I am free to go and the next person free to go, there will be chaos. Mm -hmm. But if everybody obeys the traffic, everybody can move freely. Mm -hmm. And that's the freedom that music allows you. As a result of which, the sitar can fit into the jazz format. But the mechanical, the, the, the what you call, the logistics of the instrument does not allow for change of keys. Mm. But I have developed a technique where I can change keys. Really? Yes. Mm. What I do is silence the other part of the sitar and I play the notes of the different chords. In fact, I practice chord progressions on the sitar. Mm -hmm. I have also added two notes on my sitar that they are not there, mm. that haven't been there. Um, because when you're playing a raga, you can adjust the fret your suit and fix it. So there are two, three missing notes on the sitar. My sitar is tuned on D. There are no E flat, there are no B flat, there are no E flat on the other things. But what I've done, I've added an E flat fret on my sitar. So that when I have to change keys, I can change it. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody tells me play in the scale of E flat, with a normal sitar, it's almost impossible. Mm. But now that I've added that fret, I can play E flat very comfortably. Wow. That's, so that's fantastic. It. But adding each fret you add on the sitar is like learning a new instrument. Really? Yeah, oh. because it's not the same thing. It just changes everything. Yeah. yeah, so that's it. Well, this has been a great experience talking with you, yes. and I'm sure our audience have learned a yes. great deal having seen a taste. Uh, and I understand you have a larger band, a nine-person band. Yes, it's a nine-person band. It's a full jazz ensemble, and um, what we did today was play a more or less like a chamber group, mm -hmm. um, creating music to suit the four of us, yeah. but really and truly, I mean, my signature tune is a song called Dreadlock. I couldn't play it because it's in reggae. Mm -hmm. I need a bass guitar, I need a drum set, that sort of thing. So I couldn't play that tonight because reggae does not allow for this kind of, right. of playing. Right. So what I did is I sort of used the techniques of the Indian classical music, but still was able to play some stuff with the, the idiom of calypso mm -hmm. and, and whatever have you. So, but that's mainly melodic. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much and good luck with your new CD and on your travels. Pleasure is mine and thank you very much. Thank you.